right. So last week, uh, as I mentioned briefly, we talked about um, um, marriage. We talked about relationships. But now we'll talk about made for God's body. Um, so every, the church is God's chosen people on whom he has set his eternal love. As the church, we function as the body of Christ, the body of Jesus Christ. In God's redemptive work, the church demonstrates God's loving rule and his people's glad submission. Remember, marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. The church is the already, not yet, of God's perfect rule and his perfect people. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 3, verses 8 through 12. And I need another person to read Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. And the last person read Romans 8, 29 through 30. So who has Ephesians 3? Uh, at verse 8. Ephesians 3, verse 8. Okay. You went to verse 12? Okay, I was like, what? I think I... <laughs> So you see that, as I just mentioned, uh, the church is the already and not yet of God's perfect rule and his perfect people. So the church is the institution by which God receives glory and the world sees a greater picture of who God is. Marriage is also a picture um, of who God is. Remember we talked about mutual submission distinct roles, and yet there's a oneness. Uh, I recently heard a preacher says, typically, um, one plus one equals what? Two, but he says in marriage, one plus one equals one. And I was like, that's right. Two distinct personalities, but one whole, one unit. And so you see that within the Godhead. There's three distinct personalities, all are in the same essence, and yet, and make up one God. Um, and so that's what we believe. And so that's amazing. Uh, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. The change for America, the change for the world, is within the church. We have the answers for every problem there is in the world. And the solution is Jesus Christ. And how um, those solutions are worked out is because we have a connect, a direct vertical axis connection with God. And because of this vertical connection we have with God, it should play out on a horizontal level in our lives. Because we have been reconciled to God, we're in uh, oneness with God, our relationships and different things of that nature play out in relationship to how God has revealed himself in his word. So we have the answers to all the issues that's in the word. Um, Romans 8, 29 and 30. Oh, that's excellent, because actually I had 28 there as well. Many things 
So you see, if you know Christ, you're part of the group, the called out ones. You've been chosen before the foundation of the world to receive Christ, to believe in him. You've been set apart. And guess what? It says glorify. All these words are past tense. So there are a right now reality and a not yet reality. So right now we're glorified in the mind of God, but it has not been materialized in our lifetime. We haven't seen it in time, but God operates outside of time. So it is an actual reality. One day we will be just like him. <clears throat> I don't know why my voice is cracking like that. Um, also, because the effects of Christ's on the cross, so we see there's the church is God chosen people. The church is um, how God works out within the world, receives glory and honor. Um, but also because Christ on the cross, his life, because what he accomplished at Calvary, has effects for us today as well. Um, so the first thing we see is Romans 6, 7 through 14. Romans 6, 7 through 14. No, you're fine. So, because of the death of Christ on the cross, he broke the penalty of sin, which is death. He also conquered death because if you're in Christ, you are alive. So, and he brought the power of Satan over our lives. So, in Christ, we're free. Because remember, he mentioned that earlier, and Paul mentions that. So, we are free in Christ. Um, so, there's only two categories for a person in this life you're either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness you're either in adam or you're either in christ there's no in between uh, and so because of what christ has accomplished on the cross sin no longer has power over us so no notice paul says um do not obey the sin uh in your life you don't have to obey its desires because of the Holy Spirit that is in us, he gives us the power to say no to sin. And so we can tell our bodies no. We have the power to defeat sin in our lives. Not us on our own, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that is amazing what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. I'm done with dying. Uh, you see my jacket over there? The reason why it's not moving is because I'm not in it, but I'm still alive. And that's the, for a believer, that's what it is for our lives. You might see the frame of our mortal body there, but we're still alive. We're in the presence of Christ. And so that's the blessed hope that we have, absent from the body, present with the Lord. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, because of Jesus' work on the cross if you turn to the book of John, chapter 14, uh, we look at verses 16 through 20. And I'll read this. I have a different translation today. It's the one I picked up. It was running. Um, I'll actually read verse 15 for context. It said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor 
to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. So because of Christ, he petitioned the Father to send the Holy Spirit. So when he ascended to the right hand of the Father in his glorified body, he sent the Holy Spirit to take up residence in us. So now the Holy Spirit comes alongside. He's a helper. He's our comforter. He's our paraclete. He's our partner that helps us to live out the righteousness of Christ. So he brings back to remembrance the things of Christ. And so um, the Holy Spirit, I always mention this, is not passive in our lives. Uh, as a lot of times people hear a lot about the Father, a lot about the Son, but the Holy Spirit is not passive in our lives. The Holy Spirit is like he's God himself, and the Holy Spirit is like a parent. He leads you and guides you, and he'll say, don't do that. And I was like, oh, I feel like I shouldn't do that. <laughs> you end up doing it and say, didn't I say don't do that? And then there's consequences. So the Holy Spirit aids us in sanctification. It's like, oh, why am I going through this? The Holy Spirit is making you more like Christ. He brings back the words of Christ to you. And so as you read the Word of God, you fill yourself up with the Word of God, the Holy Spirit brings those things back up in your memory when things are going wrong in your life, brings back the Word of God to you that gives you comfort, gives you peace in the middle of, of whatever you're going through. Uh, look at John 14 and 26. I've spoken these things to you while I remain with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, the Father will send him in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've told you. The Holy Spirit does not speak of himself. He speaks of Jesus. The Father sends based on the request of the Son. The Holy Spirit obeys the request and goes and bees with the believers. So you see, again, when you see marriage, you see a picture of God. There's submission, gladly, glad submission within marriage. And you see this, it's a picture of Christ. It's a picture of God, the Father. It's a picture of God, the Holy Spirit. They're all one, and yet they each have distinct functions within their union as God. And so uh, you see that. Um, also, the effects of Jesus Christ on the cross creates community. And so you see that believers are together because we have, according to Romans 8, 14 and 16, what? Romans 8, 14 and 16. Do do do. Mm -mm. There he is. Romans 8, 14 and 16. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So if you are in Christ, we all have the same Father. We all have the same older brother. We all have the same Holy Spirit residing in us. That makes us family, and family makes community. And so we're a part of the same community. And all this was accomplished because of Christ's death on the cross. Um, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Talks about a, a community here as well. It says, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside 
every weight and the sin that so easily ensnared, ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured a cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. So we see not only there's a, a cloud of witnesses on this side, there are saints who've left a legacy who's a cloud of witnesses. When we see the Hebrews chapter 11, you see them. That's gives, that gives us strength to move on. We say, hey, we see the three Hebrew boys. We see uh, Moses. We see Abraham. All these great things they did, they did it by faith. And the just shall live by faith. That's us. That's how we live. We have a community. And um, I remember growing up and uh, played a little basketball. And uh, a little commercial used to always get me going. And it was the Michael Jordan commercial. I want to be like Mike. I dream I move. You know, I dream I grew like Mike. If I could be like Mike, and you go out there, it's like, you'll see how he do his tongue, and you're like, oh, you know, you know, it motivates you. I know, I'm like, ah, you know, <laughs> you want to get out there and do it, right? That's the same thing it is with community of believers. We motivate each other to live godly lives. That's why Hebrews 10, uh, 23 through 26 tells us, we should not forsake the assembly or gathering together. We need to spur one another up to live our godly lives. So it's such a blessing. You see someone going through a difficult time, and they still trust in Christ. So when you're going through difficulty, you say, I remember how they went through this calamity, and they trusted Christ. They encouraged me. I'm so, so encouraging to see sick people, sick saints in the hospital. They encourage you to live godly lives. Here they are going through chemo, going through all these type of treatments, and yet their trust is rooted and grounded in the Lord. You know, like, what am I complaining about? You know, I had this problem at work. They're going through real stuff. Not to say your trouble is not real, but in light of, okay, and they're trusting Christ in the midst of this. Yeah, I can trust Christ too. Lord, forgive me for not for waning and doubting your graciousness, your omniscience, your power. And so it encourages us as well. All right. So the body must be justified. Uh, so now we'll talk about tracing the body. So turn to Romans 5, 12 through 21, and we'll camp out here for a little while. And I'll get somebody to read that. Romans 5, 12 through 21. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. Sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's 
disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is an excellent passage. I love it. Uh, I love all the Romans, uh, but uh, I love the whole Bible. But this is really good. I love how you see the parallel between the first Adam and the last Adam. And so many times, uh, based on the one act of the first Adam, all receive condemnation, all receive a sentence of death. Likewise, just by the one righteous act of Christ, all who believe in Christ through faith are justified. They're made right before God's eyes because now I'm believing that Christ did everything I need to be seen right in the sight of God. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to work to earn my salvation. It's already been accomplished through the death, burial, and resurrection and extension of Jesus Christ. Everything I need, Christ is accomplishing on my behalf. So I can, ah, I believe that. And because of this truth, I'm justified. God sees, he declares me right in his eyes. And so it's such a, a, a blessing. The body must be justified. Mankind always has a representative. Again, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. You're either in Adam and the wages of sin are is death, or you're in Christ. And Christ has paid your sin penalty himself. So mankind always has a representative. In Adam all die. The first man failed to obey. The curse of sin falls on everyone. Because Adam is our representative. If you're in Christ, he's no longer your representative. The brokenness of Adam led to the brokenness of humankind. All men are born with a sinful nature and are sinful. Again, the wages of sin is death. In Jesus, all live. Um, we just read this. Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Adam's disobedience messed up a lot of stuff. More than we can even explain. And uh, when God says you will surely die, it was more than a physical death. We missed out on close communion with God. Now, only can be restored in Jesus Christ. The world, according to Romans 8, the, uh, chapter 8, creation is groaning, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed, waiting for us to receive our glorified bodies so they can be out of this curse that's on the world. Their sin has really warped everything. Sin is so horrible. It affects marriages, it affects kids, it affects, you name it, sin has warped it. Um, sin is ugly. Um, mankind always has a representative. In Jesus, all are alive. Uh, Jesus died the death that we should have died. And by faith, we believe that when he died, we died. And when he got up, we got up. Um, look at Romans 6 and 4. I'm still there, okay? I should have just told you to keep your hand in Romans. Or your finger. Romans 6 and 4. Therefore we were buried in him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. 
Um, some translations may say in the newness of life. But there's a new way we look at things because we're no longer in Adam. And because we see things differently, when people who are still in Adam, we have to be gracious to them that we may point them to the light. Because when you're in Adam, you're blind to truth. And the only reason why we know who truth is is God stepped into our lives and made himself known. And so we're praying for unbelievers. We're praying that God will pull the blinders off and reveal himself. Otherwise, they will continue to grope in darkness until God is pleased to reveal himself. And a glimpse of who God is is seen within the church. Remember the passages we read in Ephesians, how glory in the church? We are God's beacon to shine forth who he is in the world. Uh, so in Jesus all are alive, the God-man fulfilled right obedience. Remember, Jesus says, my meat is to do the will of the Father. Everything Jesus did in his earthly ministry was based on the will of the Father. This is another way I mentioned last week, uh, we'll be like angels. Angels follow the will of God joyfully right away. They don't ask any questions. They do it right then and there. Just quickly. Jesus, that's what he did. Everything. He could have done so many other things. But his purpose was to do the will of God. You see the God man in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying, Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. And this is humanity talking. But you see, as uh, Dr. Adam Greenway says, you see the godness as a backdrop. He's, he stops it and like, not my will, but your will be done. So you see God um, in him, uh, the hypostatic union, the two natures in one. Distinct 100% man, 100% God, yet one body living out. The will of God perfectly. He never sinned a thought, word, or deed. Everything pleased the Father. So much so that at his baptism, God says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm pleased with him. The Holy Spirit descended upon him in a dove-like manner. It wasn't a dove. A lot of times people have like a little white dove come down. No, it just descended in that type of motion upon him. Fulfilling Old Testament prophe uh, prophecy concerning the Messiah. Uh, the perfection of Jesus is the perfection of the new man. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. I love this passage. You probably can quote it without reading it. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Our lives, who we were, were crucified to the cross. All our sins, who we used to be, it was crucified to the, fro the cross. The cross. It is pretty cold outside, but it's to the cross. And so as a result of that, we still have some residue, not in us, but in our members. Because we still have, we have not been glorified yet. So those become prayer points in our lives. And so many times our temptations come from things we're familiar with. And so those become things like, Lord... I really like this. Help me with that. This is what I used to do prior to me knowing you. So help me. Because I realize now, because I'm in a community, we are supposed to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father which is in heaven. So I'm realizing the, the magnifying glass 
that's on me from the world because they want to throw stones like there's nothing to being a Christian. There's nothing to following Christ. But also, no, I have supporters that are pulling for me within the body of Christ. So now, in light of that, I want to live in such a way to give glory to him. And I don't want to allow my life to call someone else to stumble. So I'm praying about it. So uh, as I mentioned a few weeks back, there's never a day you get up where there's not something you need to pray about. There's always something where you're talking to the Lord, Lord, help me with this. You never get up and say, got this Christian thing licked. I'm good to go. Yes. Man, Jesus, I, I, we're there. You and I, we're eye to eye. <laughs> never. There'll never be a time you're like that. You know why? Because if you ever like that, you'll never see the need for Christ. And so it's so, um, that's where legalism comes in. You'll think uh, you're doing the right thing just because you have the right actions, but you never take the time to examine your heart. And so a lot of times I'm examining my heart. Why, why are you doing this? What's the purpose behind it? Is it really give glory to God or you just want to be seen? Or why did you say that? Why did you do that? You know, so it's a constant wrestle. Ah, I probably could have said that better. Oh, oh, hey, sorry, didn't mean it that way. I meant it this way, you know. So uh, it's a every day, it's a battle. Again, in Jesus, all are alive. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, for as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Mankind can only stand before God in perfection. God doesn't take, uh, sometimes you see uh, in school, if a test is really hard, the teacher grades on the curve. So you actually fail the test, but since 65 is the highest in the class, it now becomes the A, and you grade everything else down from it. God doesn't do that. His standard is 100. No, I mean perfection. Name on there correctly, crisp paper, sharp pencil, everything. It is perfection. And the only way we can stand before a holy and righteous God is to be in perfection, which is Christ Jesus. There's no way we can stand outside of Christ. Jesus is the perfect man. Uh, he upheld God's law. He defeated death, as we mentioned earlier. He got up from the grave, and he's coming back again. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, it says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Our sin before God was in such a way that we will have to pay for our sin throughout eternity. It's, and we, we don't have the resources to pay for him. Because our best is filthy rags. Nothing we could ever offer God in ourselves and of ourselves would ever please God. That's why it's sort of funny. People post the Ten Commandments and like, hey, you just got to keep the Ten Commandments. And I was like, if we could keep the Ten Commandments, Christ would have never come in the first place. So I was, <laughs> so I was like, seriously? Now the Ten Commandments, as you see them in Christ, if you love your neighbor... Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. It fulfills those. But you can't keep the ten by yourself. There's no way. If you could, Christ would have never come. He is an uh, example of perfection for us. Mankind can only stand before God in perfection, as we already mentioned. Union with Christ makes man perfect. Through faith, man is bound to Christ. Through union with Christ, man can stand before God. Union with Christ makes man part of his perfect body. Uh, if you can turn your Bibles to Ephesians 4, look at verses 4 through 6. It says, there is one body 
and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. So our union with Christ um, makes us be able to stand before God. Union with Christ allows us to be a part of his perfect body. We've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians 2 and 13. It's because of Christ's blood, shedding of his blood on the cross, we've been ransomed, we've been redeemed. Belief in Christ unites us. The blood also unites us in Christ as well, according to Ephesians 2, 14 and 16. We have a union in Christ. Bapti baptism identifies us. So when a person is baptized, they're making a public proclamation that I'm professing publicly that I'm a follower of Christ and I'm joining myself to this body. I've been joined spiritually, and here's a public declaration that I'm a follower of Christ. And the community of believers say, amen. Welcome, brother. Welcome, sister. Now, that can't be the end of the story. We need discipleship. And I love we have community groups. This is where you can grow in community with others and grow and develop. Um, something I want to um, point out as well in Matthew 3 and 15. Matthew 3 and 15. And if you recall, this is where Jesus is about to be baptized. So when I want to read that. So Jesus allowed John the Baptist to baptize him. The question is, why? Because if you look earlier, John is having um, preaching the baptism of repentance. But Jesus has nothing to repent of because he's God. So why did Jesus get baptized? that yes but jesus came to identify with sinners that was his whole purpose yes and doing so that was to fulfill all righteousness so jesus came to identify with us we're following jesus through in obedience to get baptized because guess what we want to identify with him we love him because he first loved us um Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 26. So this is tying the body. The body must be unified. So I'm going to read for me. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verses 12 through 26. It's pretty lengthy, but all right. Hearing, the whole were hearing, there was a sense of smell. 
So you see that within the body, there's unification. We also see there's diversity within the body. There's one body, um, but there's many members. There's one body, but many functions. And he speaks in human-like terms so we can get the understanding that, you know, you're, you have one body, but you have nose, eyes, ears, feet, toes, and you need all of them. And yet, they still make up one body. Your ear is not its own entity. It's connected to your head, right? So you pull on it, it's going to hurt, right? So everything is connected, uh, which you see in there. If one suffers, all suffer. There's not, if you stub your foot on a nail or is hit with a hammer, your whole body's going to feel that. So when one member within the body feels something, we feel it. Uh, Membership unites, reveals unity. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So membership reveals unity. Unity reveals order. So we see uh, the unity reveals order. Um, there's a care for one another. There's accountability to each other. There's restoration for each other. And there's instructions for each other. And he gave, so you see, uh, unity reveals order. And so you see in Ephesians 5, 11 and 12. And he gave them apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Um, and last night was a great example of that. I just loved, um, it was just a great opportunity last night just to see the body. So many people were posting on Facebook. It was like, oh, I loved it. So many people came afterwards and said, we've got to do it again. But run, this, this has to be your thing. I'm like, hey, I don't know. It's very nervous, nerve-wracking, just a lot of detail. So, um, man, oh, so... Uh, unity reveals order. So here we go. We transition to Titus chapter 2, uh, training the body. And so this sort of uh, reemphasizes what we were talking earlier, Titus 2. And so it, um, Titus 2 lends itself to discipleship as well. And um, there's certain things I wouldn't have known um, had I had not had um, godly men in my life. Um, you learn some stuff by having godly men in your life and godly women in your life too. And so you see this. So in Titus 2, it says, But you must say these things that are consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be level-headed, worthy of respect, sensible, and sound in faith, love, and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not addicted to much wine. They are to teach what is good, so they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, homemakers, kind, and submissive to their husbands, so that God's message will not be slandered. 
in the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity, dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that the opponent will be of shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Slaves are to be submissive to their masters in everything and to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but de demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn the teaching of God, our Savior, in everything. So here you see, although the body brings unity, there's also roles and functions within that. It's saying older men should teach younger men. And they do it by being a proper example. Older women are supposed to teach younger women so they can be an example to them. Uh, the younger men follow this. So older men is like, hey, I've been there. Calm down. This is what you need to do. Um, Jordan um, is an intern I, I work with. And I, was, I tell him, I told him uh, he needs to get a standard warranty. He bought a car that had a lot of miles on it. I was like, you need to buy a standard warranty. It's going to end up costing you. Oh, it costs a lot. I was like, it's going to end up. So um, a couple of months ago, he was driving, and for some reason, he thought it was appropriate to back up on a two-lane highway, and the car came over the hill, smashed the back of the car. He did not have the standard warranty. let the covers lapse. So now the car is total. By the grace of God, they did get a new car, but he still got to make payments on this car. You know, so I was like, this is a painful lesson. And so I say, I, I tried to be the person I wish I had when I was your age. So I tell you stuff so you don't have to go through the same problems that I go through. And so um, it's so important that whether you're male or female, that you get someone that you can pour into, whether it's your own kids or their friends, where you can pass on godly, godly behavior to the next generation. We can extend the rule of God to the next generation, teaching them to trust and follow who God is. But, and back to Titus, again, uh, it shows that instructions strengthens so men role in the church, they have authority. As we mentioned earlier, based on creation. When women have submission, they line up under their husband's leadership. First Timothy 2 and 12, do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. So within the church, uh, a woman uh, has roles she can teach other women she can teach children her role is to ask her husband when she does not understand biblical teaching and because he's leading in a proper way he can uh, instruct her at home or whenever and so you see uh, an example of this is this is how you function within the church but also you see Aquila and Priscilla taking Apollos to a side explaining the word more accurately to him. So um, this has to do with the church um, and how she functions. Unity reveals order. I think that just skipped for some reason. Men and women must, let me go back. Unity reveals order. Okay, somehow it duplicated itself. All right. Um, the body must be sanctified. Men and women must worship God. They must nurture God's family. And men and women must evangelize God's word. So you see this in Titus 2, how um, there's a teaching aspect uh, that's lined out. Uh, older men to younger men. Uh, there's instruction to younger men. Uh, you see older women to younger women. And so when we follow out God's design for church, for our marriage, we give a holistic picture of what God looks like in our lives. And so as a result, people will see there's something different because the world does not operate this way. 
And sin has warped our view of marriage. Sin has warped our view of the church. Sin has warped our view of mostly everything. It's clouded our eyes. And the only way you can have clear lenses of moving forward in the kingdom is to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So the church is the instrument to where God receives glory and points others to Christ. Any questions? So next week, though, as um, the gentleman mentioned earlier, it'll be a transition week, and uh, Brother York will be teaching a class in the sanctuary. On, um, it's not right there. I think it's race and how the church uh, functions within that. And then you'll have six other options. Uh, mission Matters, uh, Into the World, Missions in the Book of Acts, Introductions to Cults and World Religions, Discover Bug Run, Life on Missions, and Six, six Christians, I'm assuming this is six things Christians everyone should know. Six Christians everyone should know. Okay, so like church history. Okay. So that'll be good too. Um, and so let's keep that in mind. Let's start November the 12th and pray for our international student conference next week. We'll be going to Cave City, Kentucky, and uh, we'll be bringing students from nine universities and trying to reach them by learning their culture and ultimately uh, trying to introduce them to Jesus Christ. So pray for that again. Let's pray. Our Father who in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We pray that it was clear, that there's clarity. And we pray that we may live in such a way that will bring you glory, honor, and praise. We ask these blessings and others in your son Jesus' name. We do pray. Amen.